but the title of the message is No One Else Will Do. He's the one we want, and there's nothing else that will take satisfy, nothing that will take its place. We always crave something in life, and we always, you know, we will go after something, especially when we're pregnant. Now, we'll go after stuff until we find out what we want, what we're craving, what we need. And and we'll get it till we we'll seek after till we get satisfied. <laughs> yeah, even in relationships, we hunt around for something that will satisfy our physical needs, our emotional needs, our mind, and our bot everything about us. And when you find finally find that person or the one that God picked, chose for you, you wonder where they've been all your life. <laughs> And it just seems like, well, now that I find you, nobody else is going to do me like you do, you know? And there's a, I think there is a song that, it, uh, that they all sing in the black churches. Uh, no one else can do me like you do, Jesus, <laughs> Lord, however it goes. And when you find that right friend, that right food, everything, it, it, just nothing else is going to satisfy. But this... It's important even in our lives here with the, <clears throat> in the spirit person, in our spirit man, our, ever since we're born, we are built to seek after something mm -hmm. because we all were made in his image and like Adam was made to, <coughs> to uh, fellowship with God and we want, we need and crave that. And no one else can do, no one, we can do all kinds of things and everything in this world, but ultimately God is the only one that will do what needs to be done to take us to heaven, what we need to make eternal life. And even in Deuteronomy, it said that I set before you a life and death, which do you choose? Nothing else will do but that life. Death will take us the wrong way in many other situations. And in Exodus, and it's important that about this time of year even, or, that uh, in Exodus 20, the, think about it. The first commandment is that, sh uh, that you are not to have no other gods besides him, above, before him. And a long time ago, my m mother and I, we studied that phrase. And it means not to have anything in place of God, not anything before our love for God, not anything, not even the things of this life or things. That's why sometimes I tend to, God comes first and I seek him because he's my God, not the housework, not the food, not the everything else. It's, he's going to come first and do what ever's needed in our in our my lives and especially now that uh, uh, I posted something on Facebook about because of Halloween in a couple of days long time ago Lord it showed me I knew this was wrong but of course there's a lot of the holiday holidays that are wrong that aren't scriptural and that 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 you produce and worship other gods and I've mentioned that on Facebook no one's actually seen it yet but it's you can't have no other God and if you're having anything to do with Halloween you're worshiping Satan everything to do with Halloween is to uh, uh, lift up Satan and the dead exactly it, it and it's actual the only time of year that human sacrifice still exists On Halloween. And then, of course, the Catholic Church brought in the Day of the Dead on November 1st, but it's the same thing, worshiping the dead. Yeah. All, and all the symbolizations of this the Halloween holiday, every, it all represents death, all represents Satan, all represents stuff. And uh, even uh, Satan, <clears throat> the pastor of the Satan, this church, has I seen a meme or a picture posted? Somebody showed it one time, and I seen it again today. That that he said he said thanks Christians for the only day you worship me. 
Satan. He knows it. Even ex witches, ex Satanists, ex saints to have nothing to do with Halloween. We'll tell you that. And there's a lot of symbols and all these things in Halloween that represent things that are of demonic things. And in the end, like I said, sacrifice and death. And see, well, we're, what are we serving? We don't want to serve death and things of the world and Satan things. It, see, Halloween is Satan's holiday, best holiday. It encompasses all, all the Christian, what we call Christian holidays, Christmas, Easter, and all these other things. All the holidays that you could ever do, Jewish festivals, everything, is this day is the most important holiday for Satan. It's that that's serious. Wait. So we don't want to serve or fellowship and do the things of the Lord. The Lord showed me this long time ago when I was uh, uh, going to do an outreach for our neighborhood where we lived. And I was a, just a young, well, I was a teenager then. And I was took off work and fasted and prayed. And I was going to do a, a community outreach to, to kids. And there was so many things that I thought about doing. The Lord said, don't have anything to do with it. And I, a lot of things I didn't understand. Of course, my mom told me these things were wrong. And I, so, and then I learned out eat later, like I was telling him, even Duncan for apples was wrong. I had that, but I realized after the information during the medieval times, that's, or sometime, they actually, one of the tortures was to dunk for apples in boiling water. So your face is literally burn off. So it's it's a ritual. Different things that, you know, different things that represent, it may seem good. <coughs> and, of course, I called it a harvest party. And, of course, kids got saved that day. But, but I didn't, made sure there was nothing to represent Halloween itself. But we got, got to stay with it. And I had my, my daughter with homeschool. She did a research paper for one of the papers for school. And she did some research and I learned so much more that of what it's all about, which I won't go too much into it, but because we we are not to have no other gods. God is our God. Right. He is our Lord and our Savior and no one else will do. All this stuff is just garbage. Even with Christmas, there's so many symbolization of worshiping idols. Right. And Easter, the same thing. That's why we don't celebrate them here. <clears throat> but the first verse here, Jesus was saying something in John 6, 31 through 35. Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw signs, <clears throat> but because you saw, <clears throat> because you ate of the loaves and were filled. And talking about when, this is after a time of <clears throat> when some of the thousands were uh, got food while they were, he was preaching. He said, "You got food. You didn't. You didn't look to me. You wanted to just see miracles and want food. You weren't here for any other reason." There's so many people. You can ask any pastor. You'll find out so many people in churches that they're not there for God to worship God. They're there for what the pastor can do, or even with our food giveaways, they'll be show up for the food, but they won't show up for church, <laughs> or, uh, you know, different things, or if they see something, or they might, a uh, miracles might draw them, but he says, you're not, you're not serious about me, you don't really want me, and realize that nothing else will do, do not work for food which perishes, and this is an example I have here. This bread, loaf of bread represents the food. It, it goes into the stomach temporarily. Right. And then it, even the scripture says it goes out the other way to, in, to the drop. And it only lasts for temporary and it's only there to do a purpose. It's only the bread of this life. Right. But the other thing I put out there is the Bible. It's the bread of life. The true life of Christ. Jesus says, I am the word, and he said, I am the bread of life. We, he said, you are not seeking for food for eternal life. And eternal life you'll find in that bread of life. 
you'll find everything you need, which the Son of Man will give you for any, for on him the Father God has set his seal, the seal of, of Jesus being his Son. <clears throat> and there's a, also a, uh, an incident with Mary and Martha. One time Jesus went to their house and Martha was busy about, she wasn't doing anything wrong. She was doing, getting things in hospitality and getting everything ready for, for the needs of his, her visitors. There's nothing wrong with that. But Mary wanted to sit at Jesus' feet and listen to him talking with whoever, there more than likely were a lot of other people in the room and some of the disciples that traveled with him. And she sat at his feet to listen and to hear what Jesus had to say. But Martha says, went to Jesus and says, ask her to help me. Ask her to take part in doing some work. I can't do this by himself. And he says, yeah, you're doing fine. And it's, do, it's a fine thing to do. But he says, she has chosen, the terms he used was, she has chosen the best part. Says so sitting and get, you could, you know, she could help her sister do this worldly food. But he, she said, he said, she's come to get eternal food, things that were for her soul. Because she wanted him, nothing else will do this. He, she realized, she was one that she realized nothing else will do. That was Jesus. And what he, and had he say, you don't just want, <clears throat> Don't just want him for just what momentary healings or to feel good at the moment or any temporary fixes. And that's many times that's happened even in our ministry here and the young lady we're talking about is for that moment, get a fix. And many we deal with, they're, oh, it's a fix. Well, they're used to just getting fixes anyway. Right. <laughs> but want him for the long haul. Because the long haul is what's going to count. Yep. The long haul is going to take you through. The long haul is going to help you when the trial comes. Even we in the natural don't just want a temporary relationship, but something that will long be for the long haul. That we have determined, Kenneth and I had determined when we were first, we both had the mind set up we weren't going to marry for just, most people marry say, well, if it don't work out, we can divorce. Okay. No, but you go for you you go in with the attitude, this is not just for temporary, it's you do it right. It's now and forever. <clears throat> and circumstances that come up that you might have to have a divorce. I know there's it happens. But it's having that attitude that that's what God wants and he gave you. Natural bread and things will only fill the stomach, like I said. But that bread of life is what is needed. This next scripture, it's further down in that chapter in John 6, the 31st through the 35th verse. He says, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. He's talking about during, excuse me, during Moses' time. As it is written, see, they were needing food and they were asking God, God sent them food the natural food, and he gave them bread out of the heavens to eat. But Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say unto you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread with the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. It's God that gives us the true bread. That other stuff was just temporary. That it only lasted because even when they collected it, it would only last that day and then rot. And the only time it stayed is on the Sabbath. They were not to collect it. They collected enough the day before, and it did not rot until the, the first day of the week they can collect again. God would not always rest it on the Sabbath day. For the bread of God is that which comes from out of heaven and gives life to the world. And that's, he surely did that. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. He will satisfy all our needs. Even in John 10, 10, the, the, you hear 
that's quoted a lot. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come to give you life and not that more abundantly. He came to give us the bread of life. He came to give us everything we need and nothing else can, will satisfy. And I know for a fact that even when I get in these, you know, you can get in these spiritual dry places and it seems like uh, unless you get in his presence or get in the word or get that true bread of life, nothing else will satisfy. You can have fun or enjoy life, but it never will do. Nothing else will do. We'll have, we'll, we will have to come to the conclusion that God is what will satisfy us and nothing else will do. We have to make that choice and decision in our mind that he's the one that we want. He's the one that's going to take care of and satisfy everything that we need. He's the one that's going to do the job that needs to be done in our lives. Whether it's healing, whether it's deliverance, whether it's salvation, whatever situation there may be. He's the one that will do it. You can go to any preacher. You, like, I, you know, even I have the abilities for deliverance and miracles and healings and that. But still, it is God that does the work. And no one else can do it. You know, Satan can imitate. He can try, he can do a lot of stuff, but he cannot save you. He can do everything, but he cannot save you. He can mimic. And deceive you, which is happening so much. The churches are being so deceived. They're following after the things of the Satan. And don't. and don't even realize it. But we have to come to the conclusion and a made up mind that no one else will do. He's the only one we want. We want to be, and in another message I have to be titled sold out, that we're completely sold out. He's all that we need. He's everything that I want. There's even a song, I think it has that phrase. He's all, he's everything that I want and nothing, you know, however it goes. <laughs> and when we have that attitude and our, that decision in our hearts that nothing else will do, that he is the only one that we're going to seek. He's the only one that we're going to go after. And he'll be right there. Because think about it. We in the natural, we want to be wanted. So we're made in the image of God. So God wants us to want him more than anything else. David even described how awesome God is. There's a few verses in Psalms. This one is Psalms 63, 1 through, through 5. Oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you. In the dry and weary land where there is no water. Thus I have seen you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands into your name. My soul is satisfied with the marrow and fatness and the mouth. my mouth offers praise with joyful lips. He said his desire is just like he, he's grown. He can't be, you know, when you're in a desert or when you uh, <clears throat> get to a place where there's no water. And there's times we've had that problem when he has to shut off the water to do the repairs. And like, uh, you should have told me I need a drink. <laughs> but you are in a, or in a, in a place of. For long periods that you don't get a chance to drink, your body longs for that water. The same way with this David, that, that same feeling he had towards the spiritual things, towards God. And he didn't know Jesus, but he knew his God. He says, I longed. He said, I would rather be in, found in the sanctuary, in the temple, than any place else in my life. And here he was a warrior person. He said, I would rather be with him there. And, and to long after God. <clears throat> All right. Psalms 36, 7 through 9. How precious is your loving kindness, O God, and the children of men take refuge in the shadow of your wings. He's tell, he tells how good God is. Why don't you want him? That's what he said. He, I want him. You can have him too. That kind of uh, eagerness, that kind of uh, 
hunger for the things of God. That's it. They drink their fill of the abundance of your house, and you give them to drink of the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. And I have noticed throughout time that there's times that uh, even this next scripture, Psalms 107, 9, For he satisfies the thirsty soul and the hunger soul he filled with what is good. There has been times, and I have found this, and I've heard others say the same thing, that when you have such a hunger and a desire to seek God and just spend time with God, there's many times even when I'm studying or seeking God for the church or anything, I realize, oh, wait a minute, I haven't eaten yet. You're not hungry because he satisfies that appetite. Even in the physical realm, because he, he says, you want me, I'll take care of you, hold you off. It's like fasting for a while. King David talks about his longing for things, and he said nothing else will do. He longed to be in the house of God in his presence. Jesus says, said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Heaven is not worth losing. Losing out by doing everything else and having other gods and doing everything else that this world can give you and seeking after things of this world. That's why the churches are not filled, the true churches. There's a many churches that are filled because they're entertainment. They're not anointing. They're not uh, uh, like uh, really given life uh, and doing the right way of doing things. So many churches are filled. But those that long for him, we long to be in his presence. <clears throat> and we gain, we may have, you can gain all riches. That's like they said, I can have all this world and I could have all the riches. That one song says, and, and everything else. But just to be with God, just to be, have his presence, just to know God and all the pardon of our sins, as the old folks used to say, and, and to have that closeness with God is more than anything else. Nothing else will do. Nothing else can satisfy. After you, like I tell people, I said, T try it. You might like it. There's an old, yeah. old saying we used to say. But if you realize, I realize there's so many times people say, well, this is a good, even though it, nothing wrong with these ministers and what they're teaching there there's a lot of people out there that need that teaching but when you get hunger for the lord and you get deeper and deeper in god so when there's they're just giving you the somebody else may be just giving you this beginner stuff uh that's not going to satisfy me i need more i need greater things and nothing else is going to do but the true all that he can give us <coughs> even though I was saved when I was young I had to realize that Jesus is my friend and that I needed and he was the one I needed and nothing else would do because I, if I didn't realize this and realize that God is the only thing that will take care of me and get me through it kept me realizing if I didn't want Jesus over and above that suicide demon or uh, above all the troubles I was going through, knowing that he's the one that's going to take me through this. I had to realize that. And nothing else can satisfy that. And seeking after his face. But even in Isaiah, the 55th chapter, I won't read that, but it, it, the first verse says, if you're hungry, come and I'll feed you. If you're thirsty, come and I'll fill you up with water or whatever thirst of water whatever why do you you spend money I'll, I'll go ahead and read that scripture isaiah 55 the first three verses the whole everyone who thirsts come to the waters don't go to some place for water or some fake church or some place that just gives you stale water I want true water of God. I want the outpouring of his spirit, which is the true water of God. And you, and you who have no money, come. You don't have to give. You don't have to. It's good to do that, but give of yourself 
that's the most important thing. He's a give if he'll do take care, satisfy everything you need in you. He says, buy and eat, come and buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money on what is <coughs> what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? It's talking about the natural things. Why do you spend? You do. We naturally, we, of course, we have to eat, we have to live and all these things. But many people are going after and giving money to a lot of these church ministers and all that. And where do they get? They may get a prophecy. But do they really get personal needs met? Do they really get the word of God for their situation? And something that will satisfy them? Or is it a uh, gimme, gimme and... Then I might get you a blessing. But that ain't the way God works. God does not work that way. <clears throat> he says, come. You don't have to have anything. I will give you what you need. A true man of God or a true woman of God is going to give you what God has for you, whether you have money or not. And many churches, like, uh, I don't speak against a lot of ministers, except for I have it on the bad list, that Joel Osteen, Unless you ha give thousands of dollars in offerings, you can't even get close to the pulpit. And, and of course, with Kanye West now gotten, getting saved and, uh, and doing things for the Lord and going around and winning souls, that uh, he has <coughs> invited him to speak. Well, yeah. He's going to draw in a lot of money, a lot of people. But we're not here to get wealthy. Sure, God will bless us to do the work because he promised us wealth. Kenneth and I know that's part of our promises. But God knows our heart, our wealth will go and buy food. Our wealth will go and buy groceries. Our wealth will go and buy what Bible. Bibles, whatever we need for the ministry, it'll go into everything that we have. If God hasn't given it to us, that came out of our pocket. We will do spend money and give it out to missions. We send out money we don't have to mission work out to Mexico and Africa. And all the time they're blessing us with realizing that God is blessing and using that. Like Apostle Garza down in Mexico. He just gave us a testimony of how God is moving. He said, because your money, the churches were blessed and the, the uh, God just fell in their convention they had just recently. And we, that we helped support that. And then also uh, Apostle Victoria in Africa, we support her. and we, She calls and texts me all the time. Not because I give her money, but she does it because she, it's, they're seriously praying for us. Mm -hmm. I know they are. They say so. And we've seen that happen even while we were visiting over there. That even this week she prayed because she saw me mention something about my leg on Facebook, on my hip. And she prayed and the pain went away. I had less pain the rest of the week. And she said, just, just stay in his rest. God got, God, she said this phrase, God has got it. Whatever he said, there's things he's told you, but God has got it in his hand. He's, he's it, you know, it just follows up with what, pro, you know, when God replenishes your promises. He says, listen and carefully unto me and eat what is good. And delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live and I will make you everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown unto David. Think about it. Not only a spiritual life he gives, but also it came to my mind because God had shown me this a long time ago that the more of God we have in us, it regenerates, physically regenerates the cells because he's, the healer lives there. We got to, sometimes we have to accept it and realize, Lord, take care of it. <laughs> you know, it's easy for us to lean on the natural things but but that's what's faith is believing god that he's there and because adam and eve they were fellowshipping with god in the garden 
God gave them all the food they want. They were healthy and very, uh, there's a scientist that said that their mindset was so much that he, see, when he named the animals, within seconds he named all those hundreds and thousands of animals by name. Very intelligent mind. It was like living in a terrarium there, uh, uh, just similar to a savant in all areas of the brain was fully being used of God. When we're only using parts of a brain right now, physically. It's so much of it. So, but we, we know that God can regenerate. He gives us all that we need. And he gave the Israelites, he said, what did he say? If you follow my statutes, if you do what, follow after me, I will keep you healthy. Uh, you won't have these diseases. You won't have all these issues and problems. Sure, sometimes they come because the devil don't want you to follow Christ. And sometimes because of past histories or past problem, situations <coughs> that have been in their life until they're completely corrected or body situations through proper eat food even. And we can have victory over all those situations. We can have healing. We, he, he's a healing God. There's nothing in this life that can satisfy us like God does. David said that. He was a worshiper. He loved God more than anything. And that's why I believe God had said that he was a man after his own heart. Because God wants somebody that loves him more than anything. Nothing else will do. And that attitude of nothing else will satisfy. God is your my only God. You're the only one that can do what I need done. We can go after things, but we won't. But they won't help unless it's only temporarily. God is the one who can take care of all those cravings and give us abundant life and eternal life. Even the things of this temporary life and things that we have to do in life, even though they're temporary, when we go according to his divine order, go according to his, following his statutes, obeying him and living for God, God will bless us to the point that things work out so much. Easier. My mom even said this. If you give God his, the first of the day, she says the rest of the day goes fine, which I've seen that happen. It, everything goes fine. <coughs> but he, and he has stretched the finances because you give given all you can for the Lord and doing what it, you, there's another message you'll have sometime in the future. I don't know when you do right by God. He'll do right by you. He'll take care of you. So if we think of God as there's no one else is going to do for us like him, then he will take care of us. God is the one who can take care of all those cravings and give us abundant life, eternal life. Because that's what's important is we're a spiritual. What is it? Uh, I think Apostle Horton has said that we're uh, spiritual bodies living in this human flesh. That we, we, we're heading to heaven and we got to work on feeding that spiritual man. You feed that spiritual man, sometimes it's natural things follow suit. And I, I found through the years, even to put God first and seek him in prayer, uh, even before going to bed and thinking about things, well, Lord, I, what I can do. And next thing I know, I'm asleep and I'm sound, go into sound sleep. And I know what it is. The devil don't want you praying. The devil don't want you thinking on things of God. <laughs> and he'll just, he'll find this distra either a distraction or he'll find something to get you rid, stop from doing what you need to do. <laughs> yeah. God, he will, t he, and he will satisfy us because we're, what did, what did we just, a couple of weeks ago, the phrase that God said, because you honor me, I will honor you. This works here because we love him and put him first and want him above anything else. We're honoring him and he'll honor us, honor us in the things that we need done. Whatever that may be. Jesus said one, anyone who hungers and anyone that needs righteousness, anyone that he needs healings, anyone that miracles, whatever. He says, just come to me. 
and I will do it. And he even said, ask and it shall be done. You need to show him that nothing else will do and act upon that, that nothing else will do and show him that he is the one that we want and that we desire more than anything. 